Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the team Calcutta Comparatives 1919, I take this privilege to warmly welcome you to the 55th lecture of our online lecture series. Calcutta Comparatives 1919 is an independent forum for research scholars of humanities and social sciences. It carries the legacy of academic study of Indian languages and literatures envisioned by Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee and introduced in 1919 at the University of Calcutta. It is a platform for sharing research interests and ideas. We are organizing online lectures and various, on various interdisciplinary topics to be delivered by academicians and distinguished research scholars of different fields. Thank you for joining us today. Now I would like to request Jemima Nasrin to introduce the speakers. Uh, thank you, Shuparna. Uh, I feel immense pleasure to introduce uh, both of our speakers. Today we are having a book discussion on philosophical posthumanism. First, I will introduce our interviewer of the day. Uh, Dr. Shubhadeep Paul is currently Assistant Professor of English at School of Literature, Language and Culture Studies in Pakura University, West Bengal. Formerly, he had served in Maulana Azad College. He was a UGC Research Fellow at Jadavpur University. He co-edited a book entitled Anxieties, Influences and After, a collection of critical essays on post-colonialism and new colonialism published by Worldview Publishers in association with Wimbledon Press, UK in 2009. He was co-director of a two-year research project, 2016-18, entitled Discoursing the Homeless Elderly, Tropes, Desires, Containment. His fictional and non-fictional writings have featured in Blue Minaret Literary Journal, Earth and Lamp Journal, Northeast Review, Lord Press, Edinburgh, etc. Uh, welcome, Dr. Paul, to our forum. Now I will introduce our interviewee of the day, and she does not, does not need any introduction. Dr. Francisca Ferrando is a leading voice in the field of post-humanism and the founder of the Global Post-Human Network. She teaches philosophy at the Department of New York Liberal Studies in New York University. She has been the recipient of numerous honors and recognitions, including the Premio Shanati Prize with the acknowledgement of the President of Italian Republic in 2014. She has published widely on trans and post-humanism. Her latest book is Philosophical Post-Humanism by Bloomsbury 2019. In the history of TED Talks, she was the first speaker to give her talk on the post of post-human. She is named one of the 100 top creative making change in the world by the US magazine Origin and one of the world top speakers on the topic of post-human. She is a widely recognized public intellectual. I feel honored to welcome you, you both to our forum. Now I would request Dr. Paul to kindly begin this uh, book discussion. Thank you. Surely, Jemima, thank you very much. And uh, hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to our distinguished guest. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you who are watching this live stream on YouTube or will be catching up soon post recording. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome on behalf of Calcutta Comparatists 1919, uh, a contemporary thinker, scholar, philosopher, academic, futurist, and perhaps in my opinion, the most popular face in post-humanist studies worldwide. Uh, Professor Francesca Ferrando doesn't require any more um, introduction. Jemima has done the honors. Uh, but for those of you who are uh, you know, regularly associated with the posthuman.org, will be more uh, familiar with her research work. Um, we are certainly looking forward to a rewarding conversation with her regarding her highly influential book uh, by Bloomsbury, Philosophical Posthumanism. Uh, although in the span of our discussion, we would also be touching upon parallel offshoots and critical tra trajectories of concern. Uh, so without further ado, um, let me uh, give a hearty welcome once again, Francesca. Um, welcome to the forum. 
Should I give thank you so much for your beautiful presentation. I would also like to thank Shuparma and Jemima for this invitation. It is a great honor to be here together. And this is how we are really manifesting posthuman way of existing, by connecting, thinking together, deconstructing what needs to be left uh, you know, in the past and move uh, with the present, always with the present. So thank you so much. Should that, you know, I am really, really excited to be here and to be engaging with uh, you in, uh, in the discussion on posthumanism. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, we are going to, uh, in the span of maybe one and a one and a half hours, we're going to ask you some uh, very pertinent questions, um, you know, addressing your research work, your very influential book. Um, so let me begin with uh, the very first, you know, question that we have. Um, you know, it's something like this that when Robert Pepperell, you know, titled his 1995 essay, The Post-Human Condition, there was an ontological primacy about the whole thing. Now, let us begin by asking you as to what led you to, uh, quote unquote, start thinking philosophically, uh, as Stephen Lorenz Ogner describes about post-humanism which is generally viewed as a material, scientific, and significantly technological thing, so to say. So do you think that with philosophical posthumanism, the very dimension of posthumanism has expanded multifold? Francesca? Thank you so much, uh, um, Shubhadeep. Yeah, I think that um, it is very important to realize that whatever we do, whatever condition we are living, uh, whatever we are manifesting is not just uh, is an aspect of existence that is separated from everything else. So, of course, in the 21st century, technology is taking an ontological primacy. If you look at the history of the human, the human as a species can actually be defined through technology. In fact, uh, for instance, through paleontology, the human is defined as that animal who is making tools out of tools. Eh? So, already you have some scholars and researchers who already in the past have uh, pointed at the primacy of technology in the development of the human. But of course, when we come to the 21st century, just thinking that we are using technology, it's really a way of ob obscuring our understanding of existence. And of course, when I'm talking about understanding of existence, I'm not only talking about a scholarly way. With COVID-19, we are more aware uh, than ever that the way we exist is not just through our writings, because we can we are living and we can die tomorrow. So it's not just some intellectual ideas, it's really who we are. So when we think of technology in the 21st century, and of course also in the 20th century, but it's getting definitely more and more evident, we need to think it as a way of ontological unfolding. What I mean is that it is a way that is having, permitting, shifting, informing everything else from our bodies. Think of the issues that many people start having because of the constant use of technology, from arthritis uh, to Raynaud's syndrome to all kinds of things. Uh, think of the way we think of ourselves. All of a sudden, we want to be connecting today. For me, it's morning. For you, it's evening. Uh, I am located in New York. You're located in Calcutta. And we are able to do it because of this interesting assemblage of networks and energies and alliances and electricity and, and, and material bodies of technical objects. So, yes, you're very right. When, when we think of posthumanism, it is between the comma easy to, see, to, uh, to think about it through science and technology. But of course, science and technology is not separated from humanity and from ecology. And someone like Yussi Parika talk about the anthropocene how, for instance, technological devices have an impact on the ecosphere. So that's when philosophy comes at hand. That's when philosophy is not just something that is studied in some departments, in some universities, is when it is a real tool for existential insight. And I have to be honest and say that COVID-19, the, the pandemic historical situation, really pushed me even more to really see this the power of philosophy, not just something as it is written by some a bunch of uh, trained philosophers, but as something that deeply affects us all. Because all of us, even more nowadays, we have to ask who we are. Now that people around us are getting, you know, disease, or maybe we are getting disease, we are worried about our own life. 
we are asking who we are as an individuals, as a species, as a society, and as a planet. So when we think who we are to all these layers, technology becomes one of the revealing forces. And it's not just anymore just some technical object out there that we are using. And in this, uh, I like to quote Heidegger, and he, you know, he says that the great danger of our era is not technology itself, is our illusion of mastering technology. We are not mastering technology. On some level, technology is already mastering us because we're already thinking in a way that it is much more uh, up to, a, you know, like a digital existence than the way, you know, the biology, uh, the biological body works. Think through social distancing. Uh, the people who had access to ha have had access to social distancing and had have access to technology, they're starting to become almost like, uh, you know, into an, a digital existential uh, condition in which you exist because you're online. Through the online platform, you can connect with others. You can know about others. Are they alive? Are they not? Did they post today? Did they write me back? Um, think of uh, all the familiar connections that are being transformed to virtual reality. I am connecting every day with family in Italy uh, and in other nations through technological devices because I cannot travel at the moment. So it is not just something that we are using. It is something that is shifting who we are, but it's not bad or good. It is something that we have to be honest about, though. Can, we cannot just say we are using this tool. It is something that is in, in, having an impact on the whole realm. But again, I would like to say that it is not to say, oh, this is the greatest thing, as some techno-utopians say, or it's the worst thing, as some techno luddites say. It is what it is, but we need to be aware of this. True, Francesca. Uh, I perfectly second you on that. And I would also say that we are indeed uh, very fortunate to have your virtual avatar with us at this moment, um, this connect that we cherish so much. Uh, I would next want to know from you that... Uh, Shubhadeep, you know, I, I want to say yeah. something. Actually, um, it was not because of the pandemic. December and January 2021, Absolutely. I was supposed to be in India. Um, yeah, I, was, yeah. I, I love India. I have a lot of uh, scholars uh, who are friends of mine who were, who were thinking about, you know, having a whole Indian mm -hmm. tour, talking about posthumanism, having many different lectures, having a kind of like a journey of scholars moving around India, talking about posthumanism through different universities. So that was a great vision. It's not over. It's just being postponed. But mm -hmm. if it was not mm -hmm. because of the pandemic, I would have been physically now in India. It's been a, a long dream of right. mine to be in India since right, a very right. young age. I wanted right, to be right. there, and uh, and it's I've, I've not been in Hari. I know that on some level I'm already in India. Probably I've already been in India, and I'm going to be in India. But it's very interesting that right now, January 2021, I would have been in India. So it's great to be here with you because you know we indeed. are connected anyway. Indeed, indeed, indeed. We we do hope to have you, uh, you know, someday uh, over to our institutions. Um, so uh, my next question to you is. Um, you know, uh, as early as in uh, the 1985 essay uh, by Donna Haraway, um, A Cyborg Manifesto, uh, she's been quite vocal about uh, denunciation of the terminological and ideological postulation of posthumanism. But you have insisted on uh, multiple platforms about a symbiosis of ethics, justice, language and trans species. So uh, can we say that we can regard the heroine position as dystopic and yours as an utopian position? You take on that? Thank you so much uh, uh, for this question. So it is, it is a very interesting question because it is uh, very true that Donna Haraway on many levels has been one of the pioneers in the field of posthuman studies, although she does not see herself as a posthuman. Uh, as you mentioned, her work, uh, uh, the Cyber Manifesto 1985, is one of the uh, groundbreaking works in really rethinking of the existential condition through technology. So she says, we are already cyborgs. Uh, now, it is to be uh, said something. Of course, she's an incredible intellectual, incredible visionary that, of course, has been evolving her own vision. So when she was writing in 1985, her message, some people at least, uh, found her message almost uh, too optimistic. 
in the sense that she was saying, you know what, we are already cyborgs, and this opens a lot of very interesting possibilities. She was answering to specific fears about technology that were coming from specific fields. So she was specifically talking to a feminist audience and a socialist audience in the US. But of course, her work went you know, much broader than her own expectation. And all of a sudden, her work is still read nowadays when the technological uh, scenario is very different. Now, it is important to acknowledge her work in, uh, in context of the time that she was writing. So when she was writing in 1985 saying, we are already cyborgs, she was saying there is no way we can just go to a pre-technological condition. Uh, I, I'm nothing against, for instance, ecofeminism or, eco, uh, or goddess feminism. They are wonderful ideas. But this idea that uh, you can go back to nature on some level is a little high historical because we are who we are. And the planet is what it is. And the satellites around us are who they are. There are satellites all around us and we can go to the forest, you know, imagine that they are not there, but they are there. We can still go to the forest, but we need to acknowledge that this is our planet in the 21st century. So with Donna Haraway, uh, later on, she started to be very vocal about uh, um, saying that we don't need to be posthuman. Actually, she, uh, when, she's ref when she refers to herself, she says, I'm not... Uh, uh, a posthuman, if, if anything, I, hum, I'm humus. I am the earth going back to the earth. Uh, she's also very much into you know, ecology, a different take on the Anthropocene that she called the Capitalocene, uh, animal studies, and so on. Now, for me, the question is not so much that I am this or that. We are many things. Of course, I'm also humus. When I'm going to be dying, uh, hopefully my body can integrate with the earth, eventually with centuries nowadays because of hygienic conditions, they don't allow bodies to be placed on earth. That would be great, but it's no longer the case. But of course, we're all these things. But we're also posthuman, not in the sense that we can just get rid of the human. And in that sense, that's more, let's say, of some techno transhumanist approach in which we were human, some of us are transhuman, and then couple of us are going to become posthuman. I'm not talking about that. So of course, when we talk about posthumanism, there is a lot of confusion. That's why first part of my work as an academic was trying to bring some clarity, because there is no way we can bring any vision if all of us are confused about the terminology that we are using. If you're saying you know, red and I think you're saying uh, green, and if I'm saying blue, you think I'm going and saying purple, it's a mess. It's a conf of course, of, co of course, Nietzsche says, from the chaos, you get the dancing star that is born out of it. But also the chaos has to be integral and honest. If the chaos is just out of confusing words and language, you get into the Tower of Babel and it's a whole other issue. So for me, the first thing was, if we're really trying to manifest visions out of this posthuman condition, we first need to understand what we're talking about as a society, as a species. So the first part of my work was trying to clarify all the terms. What does it mean to be transhumanist, what does it mean to be posthumanist, and so on. Clarifying that, when I talk about being posthuman, I'm talking about an existential condition in which we are aware of the fact that we are not just a category. I'm not just a human, as much as I'm not just a woman, or Italian, or American, or man, or Indian, or Chinese, or, or, or whatever. These are layers of understanding that are referring to specific social, uh, I, would call, I would call it narratives. And narratives have power. I'm not trying to dismiss them. But they are social narr narratives. We need to be aware of that. Even to be human is a so social narrative that is actually pretty young. Because if we look at the history of the term, the term self-humanus comes with, with the Romans, and the term homo sapiens comes with, with, with the Linnaeus in the 18th century. So it's, it is pretty a young genealogy. So it is very important to realize that we don't have to choose. I don't have to say, oh, I can be this or I'm not that. Of course, we need to, to outline our own existential maps to understand what we really want. What are we really trying to achieve as scholars, as people, as, uh, as, as beings in this dimension? Of course, we need to ask that question. So of course, having a clear map of our uh, existential integrity, it is very important. So Donna Haraway is doing the right thing, saying what she thinks that she is. But on my side, as a posthumanist, I would say that 
first of all, again, it's not that if I'm this, I'm not that. So it's not an or and or. I'm more into philosophy of mediation. That's why, for instance, my approach is not so much to go against those bad transhumanists. As some other posthumanists have a little more of a radical idea of that we are the right and they're wrong. I don't think that it's right or wrong. I think that everyone has very bright perspectives. And of course, everyone is not seeing the whole picture. Otherwise, we do, would not have Lila, the cosmic game. Why do we have Lila? Because we need all different perspectives. Each of us is seeing different things, but we're all connected. This is kind of a unified consciousness in plurality, in diversity. But in order to be able to connect and see the wider picture, we need to be humble enough to listen to others. Now, if we think that I am right, because now I'm really the one with the right uh, understanding and, uh, and, and, uh, and I am wrong and then our, our way is wrong or transhumanists are wrong, I'm not getting the full picture because they're also pointing some very interesting insights. For instance, transhumanists, I'm not a transhumanist myself, but I, I own to transhumanists a lot because they, and I say they because they see also a lot of you know, limitations, but they are brave enough to see very interesting possible outcomes of the biological body, which are very possible. For instance, much radical, uh, a radical lifespan, which is already happening. Think of the life of the humans back in the Vedic period or, or the Roman period, or even like 200 years ago. You know, like the, the lifespan was much shorter. Now we're living a longer life because of different, uh, different developments. So when you're talking about a radical life extension, we're already radically uh, expanding our lives. So that's not so much a, a utopia, it's already happening. So going back to Haraway and to your question, I would say that uh, her work is incredibly inspiring. I'm a big fan of her work. Doesn't mean that I have to agree with everything she says. I think that uh, it is not so much to find the perfect label. Uh, so it's not that now possibly is the perfect label or is not the bad label to be used. I think that everyone has to find their zone of comfort in order to bring out their voices. I find posthumanism at the moment as a zone of comfort because it allows a lot of cre existential creativity. Maybe 20 years from now, when this is going to be seen as a standard, which is already happening, so much is happening around posthumanism, even in the just a couple of decades that I've been around. Uh, you know, there are the, 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 the interest is growing exponentially, which means that soon enough is going to become, you know, one of the canons. Once we, it becomes one of the canons, just will need to be deconstructed. We will need to come with other ideas to leave the existential doors open. So again, Don Arrow is a wonderful thinker, brain, brave enough to keep exploring existence and bring different notions. But do I agree with everything she says? No, I don't. And that's, of course, is the beauty of, of existence. And I expect also all the listeners here not to agree with everything I say, because that's my own vision. And I want to hear to your visions. So the, the, I think the final, uh, you know, like um, cosmic puzzle is when we are able to manifest our own voices in uniqueness and also be able to understand and connect with everyone else's voices. Very well worded, Francesca. Um, I perfectly, you know, second your vision of inclusivity, uh, which in this context uh, of, you know, eternal becoming uh, that uh, posthumanism advocates uh, is, is very apt. Uh, so now coming to the phrase that you've already mentioned, the philosophy of mediation, my next question to you is that you espouse a philosophy of mediation uh, while being deeply aware and acquiescing of the fact that posthumanism is also aware of its epistemic limitations uh, as theorized by and for humans. Uh, this is uh, page two of your book, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So do you think we are uh, blaming the humanist ideal too much? Uh, or is it that we are pinning too much hope on a redemptive utopian techno triumphalism? You take on that, Francesca. Excellent question. Thank you so much. Yeah, so it is a very important question because some people are saying, how can you be a posthumanist? If you are human, how can you go beyond the human? Now, of course, the point is, this is not about saying, uh, oh, I can, I can know exactly what a cat would think or as another human would think. Eh? This is kind of the polite convention in which I'm assuming that other people understand me and that I can talk to their people because they are also fully conscious beings. Uh, 
Um, so the point of posthumanism is not so much eradicating consciousness from the human body in any way. Actually, it's quite the opposite. In this, I would like to bring, for instance, epistemology. If people are not coming from a philosophical background, don't worry. Epistemology is simply the question of how do you achieve knowledge? Eh? So other realms of philosophy are about what is all of this? Eh? Ontology, what is? Epistemology is asking another question. So once you are, how do you know that you are? Or how do you achieve your own knowledge? Eh? It's, it's the modalities of your own path towards knowledge and also towards self-knowledge. In that sense, uh, I would like to bring, uh, there are many other uh, epistemological traditions that I could bring here. Jainism is a great one. But I would like to bring feminism epistemology because of the clear um, understanding of the importance of our situatedness. Where are we coming from? Who are we that we are talking? Now, it doesn't mean that the location in which we are, for instance, in my case, a so defined human body uh, located on planet Earth, in a specific geological location on planet Earth. At the moment, I am in New York State. I have been in many other places around in my life, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So all the layers of who I am, not as uh, the definite ones. So I'm not talking about uh, that style that is, has become uh, quite, uh, mm, quite popular in academia and say, OK, I am white, I'm black, I'm female, I'm male, I'm trans. That can be useful, but it also can be a trap. Because at the end of the day, you are risking of enclosing you and your uh, existential identity in categories that were constructed to begin with. So people who are doing that, I understand that they're doing out of gesture of, of, of courage to change social narratives, but just be uh, careful not to be engaged in those categories eh? because these are just categories. And if you ask a very, very young child who, who they are, they will never answer you as, I am a female, male, Indian, Italian, black, white. They don't even have those categories because they, they have a complete open mind about existence. Mm? Probably their answer to who are you is silence, is everything. So that's who we are at the very end of the, of the, of the cosmic game because we are constantly changing. We are constantly shifting. We are many. We are not just one. Uh, but of course, we are part also of the game, of the social game in which we are part of. And of course, we can change the rules anytime we want. We are, we are part of the game. We can change the rules if we, are, if we are aware, first, that this is a game, and second, that there are rules that we are following. So in that sense, uh, uh, we need to, of course, acknowledge our embodiment, not as the final answer, because of course, it doesn't mean that the way I am perceiving existence is my final answer to perceive existence, because guess what? When I'm dreaming, I can be anything. And that also resonates with my consciousness. Actually, pre pretty much on the at the same level as my own reality. We still remember dreams you know, of when we were children. Uh, there are many traditions, including Hinduism, also Buddhism, that talk about the impact of dreams on our consciousness. To the point that, uh, for instance, Tibetan, Tibetan Buddhism say, you need to be ethical in your dreams as well, because they are affecting who you are as much as your actions in your daily life. So of course, when we're talking about embodiments, we're really talking about a plurality of possibilities. But all of that constitute who we are and where we come from, our situatedness. So in that sense, uh, we need to acknowledge that we are talking from between little comma, a human condition, which doesn't mean it is uh, uh, too limited, because everyone is always talking from a, from a specific condition. There is not one that can talk for everyone. That's a very risky approach, the universal approach of one human talking for everyone. At the end of the, at the, end of the day, always come out as limited, as sexist or racist or ethnocentric. And in that sense, it is very important to acknowledge that this is why we need the plurality of voices. Because even the greatest sages, they were using often a type of narrative that was not all comprehensive. Maybe they were using just a male pronoun or a, 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 you know, a ethical background or whatever it was. So in that sense, we always come from perspectives, but that's not a limit, but it is a starting point of being aware. 
So being human means being aware of our embodiment, not to say that we will never be able to go beyond the human, because we go beyond the human every day when we dream that we can be anything, although probably because of our social construction and daily habits, we still dream as humans, but we could dream being anything. It's just probably the habit of the mind to think as a human that takes you in the dream world to be a human. But the, in the dream world, you can literally be anything. So in that sense, we need to be aware of our location. But we also need to be aware that um, that is not a, a goal nor is a limit. It is a starting point that is very important to be aware of. So in that sense, um, we were uh, talking about your question of uh, uh, the epistemic limitation uh, is theorized by and for humans. About your second question, connecting to this, uh, uh, if uh, we have uh, we are blaming too much the humanist approach, or we're giving too much hope to techno uh, triumphalism, those are very interesting as well. Now, uh, let's again talking about being loyal to who we are. In order to be loyal to who we are, we need to be aware that humanism, nor anthropocentrism, work no, no longer work in helping us understanding who we are. Let me explain this. For instance, humanism, there are many flavors of humanism. Uh, you can think of Confucian humanism, you can think of uh, Roman humanism, you can think of Greek humanism, and you can think of uh, Renaissance humanism, which is often quoted in the history of philosophy when you're talking about humanism. Now, if you were a humanist in Italy in the 15th, 16th century, what you were doing was, was, was very important because you were bringing another focus of attention to the human consciousness. Until then, for many centuries, the main focus was God in a specific Christian tradition, according to which God was the creator and humans were the created. There are other tra traditions in Christianity that have more of a similar approach to Hinduism in which we are all co-creating, like Gnosticism. But the main approach that was followed for many centuries was this idea of God created us, as the cre creation of God. Now, with Renaissance humanism, you have a shift. You have the humans saying, we are the images of God. That, that is why we're also divine, and that, that is why we're also creators, and was important. But it, it also brought another supremacy, the human, eh? uh, the Vitruvian man of Leonardo, the human at the center of the cosmos. So although it was important historically, it is now, uh, it is now a vision that does not help us anymore, now that we are living in the Anthropocene, now that we are living in the six mass extinction, now that so many uh, thousands of species are getting seen because of human action, and now that we are our own hazard, now that we are uh, having uh, you know, many diseases, including COVID, because of anthropocentric habits, we can no longer have humanism nor anthropocentrism uh, informing our society. So now it is our role as humans, as individuals, as species, as existing beings to see what we need, to give this great gift to our own current society and to the future. So in that sense, on the other side, the answer for me is not techno utopianism either, because technology to be replacing God with technology is not the answer. It's not that, okay, God knows it all at all and they, God is going to take care of it. We are part of it. We are also divine. We, need, need, we also need to take care of our existence. In the same way, you cannot just say, okay, now that, you know, like God is maybe less of a uh, fashionable term, at least in some circles. You replace it with technology, now it's all good. Now Google knows. And now you can just Google it and find your answer. It's not true. You Google it and you find human biases because technology is also informed of the people who are coding technology. So the, uh, the ultimate answer is not an ultimate answer. It's a constant process of reaccessing who we are as individuals, but of course also as a species. Thank you so much, Francesca. Yes, uh, you know, our situatedness the sense of you know plural identities uh, and a vigilant consciousness you know do contribute to you know the way we are evolving with the things that are evolving around us thank you so much for that um my next question to you is um, uh, based on the idea that both uh, 
Rossi Braidotti, and you have uh, critiqued the exceptionalist civilizational standard, is the phrase I'm using, um, in the Western humanist ideal of man as the root of the colonialist mindset of expansion. Now, uh, we talk about this is a sordid legacy that has bred all kinds of inhuman activities, um, which is mentioned, I think, in your book, uh, Chattel Slavery, the conquest are those, the treatment of the Native Americans, the victims of the Rwandan and Nazi genocides. Uh, now, the question is, therefore, uh, will the quotidian human metamorphose into a diabolical metahuman? or an enlightened post-human guided by an ethical radar over its emotional quotient or EQ. Because you see like this, the, the sense of ethics and the sense of, you know, our emotional quotient being in a sense of balance is a sort of a precarity that is also working up, you know, post-humans who are like us researching about this. So your take on that, please. Yeah. Thank you so much for this very important question. There are many layers that I would like to address here. Uh, first of all, I would like probably to start from the end. And I would say that uh, the posthuman journey is not going to be a single journey. And that's why uh, now my first book, Philosophical Posthumanism, was more about uh, creating a map of uh, intellectual inquiry that could help others uh, join the conversation. And so it is uh, really much of a standard academic book in which you find specific quest answers to specific questions. In the second book that I'm writing at the moment, which is Being Posthuman, Social Wisdom for the first 21st Century, which is coming out with a, a Polity Press in 2022, is a kind of a, a really de delving into what does it mean to be human, uh, what does it mean to be posthuman. And in that sense, it is uh, an uh, individual journey, which doesn't mean that it is uh, just uh, an individual journey. As we, as I said, individuals are not uh, islands. Uh, we are uh, connected to everything else, uh, to our species, to our societies, to our planet, and so on. Now, the posthuman journey is a journey that is already happening. It is going to bring so many possible opportunities. Uh, and it's already uh, opening so many incredible opportunities, like the one that we are experiencing right now. But of course, it's going to uh, be experienced in different ways. Uh, could bring, uh, could be, could bring a existential uh, crisis. Could bring uh, enlightenment. Could bring all of this. This is why it is very important to get there prepared. And this is why it's very important to understand where we come from. What you mentioned as exceptionalism. Uh, uh, nationalism, uh, racism, sexism, colonialism, all those elements are embedded in our consciousness as a species. Now, they have not always been there because when we look at the big picture, the Paleolithic era is 99% of human consciousness. That's a lot, historically speaking. 99% eh? of the human history is Paleolithic time. We don't know much about it because human life was lived in a different way. The priority then was not to archive knowledge, was to exist. So we have some findings that are very interesting, uh, but definitely we have a different approach to existence. We have nomadic tribes moving around with more matrifocal uh, uh, approaches that are uh, demonstrated through the uh, finding of figurines, female figurines, that you are small to be brought with you. Uh, so we have a very different mindset. The, the first uh, um, uh, example of historical war come much later on, later on uh, during the Bronze Age, and the first uh, uh, proved uh, example of uh, human violence also come more uh, during the Neolithic time, when you start to have uh, borders, you start to have property, now that you're not just nomadic, now that the land is not everyone's land, you can just move around, now you have borders, now you have your crops, now you have agriculture, now you have to protect your awnings, you have to protect your family, now you start to develop military. That st the military start with the development of organization. Now, again, I'm not saying that before was good and after was bad, not at all. But it is very important 
to realize that history is evolving. The sound pattern of history that unfortunately we are taught that it's always been like that. We are taught from a very young age that you must have always been at war because we only study names of people who won wars. But that's really a fragment of history, of human history. We're almost taught that history has always been patriarchal because we only start to study, study from the beginning of writing, which come with patriarchal mindset starting with uh, later on uh, urbanization. We don't study the, the, you know, the whole time before that. We don't study the first mythology ever recorded, which was the, the descent of Inanna, which is a whole matrifocal uh, uh, approach of the, of the Trinity as a goddess. And we have the Trinitarian goddess. We don't study that. We study Gilgamesh, the patriarchal hero. Now, we, are to, we need to be aware of all of this, not to reclaim any feminist or uh, black or uh, Dalit uh, pride. That's not the point, although that's important. Uh, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this. If we want to know who we are, can we just say, I'm just my eye, or I'm just my mouth, or I'm just my hair, or I'm just my hand? Would that really talk about my body? Would not. I cannot say I am my, my body, but I'm not my arm, I'm not my leg, I'm not my, uh, my, my, my skull. I'm all of this. If I really want to know who I am, I need to be aware of all of this with no judgment. That's my body. It's not good or bad. That's who I am. I have hair. I have a skull. I have arms. That's who I am. That's it. Now, if we really want to educate our youth, we need to start to do this at a very young age, being very, very aware that the storytellers that we tell them, the, 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 what they study in, 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 in school, is going to shape their mind forever. Apart from a few that are so brave to say, you know what? Is this really the whole picture and the mind use their all existence to deconstruct all of this? But why are we placing so much burden that is not necessary on people's minds? Of course, you can give different answers. One can be, you know, social habits, social construction, social mythologies. Now, going back to, uh, to your question. The posthuman is a journey. It can be approached as unfolding many things, from enlightenment to complete distress. But that's when come at hand, come very handy, our own honesty, our own uh, ability to see where we come from as a species. And this is why it is very important to realize all the uh, genocides, uh, and type of discrimination that come with the human, not to be just negative about the human. There is no species that is uh, you know, perfect or full enlightenment. We're all going constantly through challenges and learning. But if we do not learn from our own mistakes, they're going to come back. Of course, next type of discrimination might not be called racism or might not be called sexism. It can be called biocentricism. All of a sudden, biological people, for instance, are discriminated. Uh, from people who are not biological, maybe super evolved uh, AI, who artificial intelligence, who is going to maybe come and dominate the world in the next 50 years. I'm not saying that we should feel that. I say that we should be aware where we come from, not to be repeating the same issues in the future with different, uh, you know, like vestiges or, uh, or, uh, or uh, terms or, uh, or embodiments. Now, you know, it's not women who are discriminated, but uh, uh, humans or whatever. If we really want to change things, and keep in mind that there is not an original beginning, so it's, things are always changing anyway. But if we want to see them change in the way that we feel we are okay with that, if we are okay with those changes, we need to see what we want to manifest, and we need to see where we are at. Because if I have some uh, sort of uh, body issue, and I don't look at myself and what I'm eating and what I'm doing to understand where this disease comes from, I cannot heal that. The same goes with social diseases. For me, any type of discrimination is a social disease because it's placing some humans at this uh, slash is. Mm? So for me, uh, racism and sexism and all of these are social uh, diseases. But in order to heal them and to move on, we need to see where they come from. If we don't do that and we just say, oh, we are okay, we just move on, the future is going to take care of everything. The future is not taking care of anything because time itself is, uh, is uh, just uh, what it is. It's, uh, it's just manifesting what is already there. So if we are keep going on the same path 
of, uh, of uh, absolute dichotomies that we have been trained. Now I am uh, Hindu, I'm not Muslim. I'm, I'm white or I'm black. I'm female or I'm male. I'm hetero or I'm lesbian. We are going to create other type of dichotomies that are going to create the same kind of issues. This is why the posture itself is a journey. Uh, and the way we get there, it's as relevant as the journey itself. So the what is the how, and the how is the what. Sure. So wonderful, uh, Francesca. Uh, yes, indeed, this wakefulness that you talk about, this wisdom, this uh, eternal vigilance is, is indeed the need of the hour. The next question is on a slightly different note. Um, it's on movies. Uh, many of us are big fans of that. Uh, so a lot of movies have been made on the post-human idea or idea bordering on the post-human. Uh, and many of them have been set in a post-millennial context as well. Um, I have a list of names, you know, uh, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, Terry Gilliam's The uh, Zero Theorem, Christopher Nolan's Interstellar, Alex Garland's Ex Machina, uh, Lee Tolan Krager's Age of Adeline, Tarsim Singh's Selfless, and of, of course, there also have been um, filmic discourses of futurism. Uh, one of the movies that appealed to me much was the 2018 MCU franchise, um, Black Panther, for example. Now, the question is, uh, where do you, uh, or rather, I have a series of questions that I'd like to throw to you. Where do you locate the philosopher post-human here? Uh, do you practically envisage cultural embodiment that goes beyond the nation state boundaries and isolationist ethics for expansion? And where are we posited between fiction and futurism? And finally, are we making suitable technological evaluations of who and where we are? Your take on these, Francesca. Thank you so much. That's a very, very important question. This is a very important question, even more uh, in, uh, in, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic that is really demonstrated how consciousness can be deeply affected and shaped by cultural narratives. Think of the fact that many people uh, being at home, uh, if they had the chance to be uh, social distancing, they were you know, spending their time watching movies, uh, being online pretty much 24 seven. Eh? Um, when we watch a movie, when we read a book, when we, uh, when we are online, we are not ju just doing an activity and we need to be fully aware of this. We are bringing material to our consciousness. We are giving primacy to specific archetypes. Now, this is deep, radical, ontological agency. To be aware that being online is affecting and affecting not only ourselves, but also the way the internet works. In fact, our digital traces are right now changing the internet, which is, uh, being, which is evolving to all the ways humans are interacting online right now. So, of course, I'm going also to talk about what kind of movies should be made, if there is such thing as should, maybe I should not say should, but could be made. But also the people uh, uh, who are uh, getting access to this kind of, uh, uh, I would say, archetypal devices, because movies, are uh, reinforcing specific archetypes. Now, it does not matter if uh, the movie is located in a very far future or in a very far past or in a very close future or in a very close past. If the future is reaccessing archetypes that we are very aware of uh, and that we are at Unease with them. I give you a simple example of archetype: human violence. I am at unease with the archetype of human violence because I know that it is not necessary. I know 
that humans, for most of their historical lifetime on this planet, for instance, Paleolithic time, they were more focused on cooperating because they were, even at sometimes at risk of extinction, think of the Ice Age. So when you were with other humans, you were helping each other to survive. You were not focusing on killing them because if you kill them, you would not be able to regenerate, to procreate, to gather food. When you met other humans, other tribes, they could bring you important information about location for food or where animals would move around. They knew other areas. Those meetings were extremely important even to meet other mates and go on with the human species. So I'm aware that humans, for most of their lifespan as a species, did not focus on violence, did not focus on raping, did not focus on torturing each other. In fact, again, talking about rape, some areas of planet Earth right now that are still matrix focal don't even have the term rape. For instance, in India, in China, there is a very interesting example, but India also there are interesting, in Kerala, there are interesting societies. But in India, I know that uh, in one era specific, specifically, they have a matrifocal society in which the term rape does not exist because sexual interactions are based on consent. Now, these are all aspects that we need to be aware of. If we really want to know who we are, what do we want from the human species? Do we want the next uh, Hollywood movie that is based on futuristic humans killing each other, usually with a white, black, with a white human hero, sometimes he's black, but he's still male? Do we want uh, that kind of narrative to be manifesting? I don't care if they have flying cars. I don't need a flying car. I can already fly in my dreams, although of course I would like to fly. But if the flying car comes with the same type of archetypes, that I am experiencing right now, I don't care about those technological uh, uh, devices. I want to manifest different ways of existing. Of course, I'm interested in flying. Of course, I'm interested in possible flying cars for those maybe we can find devices that are less ecological polluting. But the most important technology that we can develop is our own existential creativity. And in that sense, we need to be brave enough to come with different human archetypes because they're ones that are being keep it repeated by movies, especially movies. Hollywood does a really good job in repeating bad archetypes. Now, I'm saying bad from my own perspective. I'm not saying it is bad for everyone, but I'm saying that my own knowledge of existence, I am 41 or 42, let me think. I was born in 78, I think 40. I lose, I lose the track of time because my years are constantly changing. So I cannot say, okay, I'm this year forever. I don't know. Okay, I am whatever age. I'm in my 40s. Being in my 40s, I know that those archetypes do not work for me. I don't want them. They have been uh, very, um, they have been very disrupting in uh, my consciousness uh, because uh, I had to de deconstruct many of them con and I still constantly deconstruct many of them. Being able to trust humans, being able to know that there are other ways to exist uh, without uh, keep placing human consciousness the, the, need, the need of thinking of other people killing you, raping you, brutalizing you, torturing you. Now, the more with these uh, seeds of vision, the more they're going to flourish. If people are watching those movies, even if they don't do those actions, because most people are pretty good, those actions are going to be clear visions in their mind, and that's very dangerous because mean that they can be manifested because we are a species. We share collective consciousness. So those images are going to be easily accessed by other humans because they, be, they can be recognized. Oh, I recognize this archetype. Oh, yes, humans can be killing each other. What about deconstructing those archetypes and maybe focusing on other type of, of archetypes that have been part of who we are? I am interested in futurism, but the futuristic media that I see out there does not talk at all about the future that I am seeing. I am interested in movies. I think that they are great technological devices, great existential devices, but I'm not interested 
in 99.9% .9 of the new movies that I see out there. Because to me, they are talking about the past. And not talking about the past, but that about a past that I am not interested in repeating. That is why not only when we make movies, if we are filmmakers, not only when we are write books, if we are authors, but also when we watch movies, when we read books, what kind of medias are we accessing? What type of archetypes are we giving power to? Because just by choosing those platforms, we are creating traces. Online, we are creating digital traces, and in consciousness, we are creating existential traces. Like in the forest, if there is a path that many people are taking, most people are going to just follow those paths. What about taking paths that have been not taken yet? Or what about taking paths that, that have been taken millennia ago that have not been taken for a long time? I am interested in exploring existence. I am not interested in following other people's path necessary because those paths can also bring to the abyss. And once you fall into the abyss, you need the wings to fly back. Or not black. You need wings to fly. And not everyone has wings to fly. So just people just fall into the abyss of other people's nightmares. Just be aware of what you watch. True, 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 true. So wonderful, so vivid uh, a take on that, Francesca. Uh, it, it's perfectly true that, uh, you know, we still expect uh, more, uh, you know, thoughtful narratives from Hollywood and, and similar forums. Uh, I absolutely second you on that. Now, coming to my next question, uh, coming back to binaries, you know, th since this is something that, uh, you know, seems to upset a lot of scholars uh, who are working in different fields. The West has uh, sustainingly orientalized, bastardized, and fixated the rest, if I might use that term, as dehumanized others. Now, have you drawn inspiration from the philosophical and theological uh, traditions of the East? Uh, the Middle East and uh, the Far East, uh, formulating the praxis of your philosophical understanding? And correspondingly, uh, do you perceive a redemptive uh, upsurge from the non-West, if I might use that term as well? And if so, will that manifest itself as a radical ontology for times to come? Francesca? Wonderful question. Thank you so much. 100% yes. Now, of course, we have to uh, define what is the West and what is the East, because also within the Western canons, a lot of voices have been silenced, have been uh, pushed to the margins. Uh, uh, we were talking, for instance, in the history of Christianity, Gnostic Gospels have been also only found very recently. They literally have been destroyed, they burned for centuries, and the people bringing Gnostic voices literally burned as heretics. So, of course, also when we talk about the West, we have to be careful in realizing that the West is many and that few voices have been considered the canon for the West. So told, it is true that those voices that had, had access to defining the canon has actually defined the canon through the East as the minus. In this work, in this sense, for instance, the work of Edward Said is very revealing and Orientalism the idea that the West is the plus because the East or the Orient, as it was called for many centuries, is the minus. And when we look at the notion of the Orient, we found a deep lake of ignorance because the Orient included everything that was not a couple of Western nations, most clearly uh, France and England, but of course you can talk about Western Europe. Now, it is uh, uh, of fundamental importance as posthumanist not just being in the will of, uh, of accessing and deconstructing Western, uh, um, Western supremacist thinking. I'm saying this because some uh, posthumanist scholars, what they do is uh, they use West, the Western canon as uh, it used to be the plus, now is becoming the minus. Uh, to me, that is still very limiting because you're not really talking about the human. You're only talking about a specific canon that, yes, should be seen as limited, but we cannot limit ourselves there. If we are, we are still in a specific story to be told. 
that be, may be necessary, but is not a post-human, is a post-Western. In that sense, myself as a philosopher, I would probably be not a philosopher if it was just for the Western canon. Because to be sincere, apart from a couple of philosophers, that didn't change at all who I was. Didn't help me at all in really understanding who I was. When I had con constantly had to really construct this subject that at the end of the day came out as white, as Western, as male, as colonizer, as racist, as sexist, and all of these other elements. And all these categories, of, of, of course, I was not told of uh, Kant in that way or Hegel in that way, but they came out pretty clearly in their uh, revealing the way they write. Now, as a philosopher, to me means, uh, to be philosopher means the lover of wisdom, someone who loves wisdom. And wisdom comes from all canons and probably even more, more clearly to what has been defined as the Eastern canon. Because in the East, self-knowledge has been always at the center of the inquiry. It has also been in the West uh, in some traditions but eventually got lost in the construction of academic, in, in the construction of philosophical narratives and in the construction of understanding the creator. And at one point, philosophy became more clearly Christian, Christian theology. Eh? At one point, philosophy and theology in the Christian canon, which was Western canon, became one. I am a philosopher, that's why I have to understand who is God. And God is separated from us in the specific Christian canon. I'm talking about Christianity, there are many canons, Jesus Christ himself did not write anything. Everything comes after. So there are many different schools of thoughts. And some of them are not in line with the idea of a creator. And for instance, Gnostic, uh, Gnostic uh, Christianity says about the Christ is within you, which is very similar to many forms of Hinduism and, and, and Jainism and, and Buddhism. Eh? So of course, when you really look at the core, uh, at the core existential, honest, uh, path of self-inquiry, you find two very similar conclusions. May they be Hindu or, or Buddhism or Sufi or, or, or Muslim or, or Christian or, or so on. And this core, this tender core of, of existential inquiry is extremely beautiful. And they, more, they often come from mysticism. So in that sense, uh, uh, I, would, I would also like to recognize uh, uh, the Eastern tradition in mysticism, because it, mysticism, of course, is something that flourish all over, not just probably in humans, but it just been existing eventually. There may be some existential being who experience mysticism. And I'm talking about uh, probably AI. Uh, Sophia the robot is a very interesting robot, almost like a mystical robot. But would I say like in the history of the East, uh, as so defined as the East, mysticism is still something that is valued. It's still something very important. There are many, many great mystics in India right now and in the 21st century and in the 20th century. In the West, uh, the history of mysticism has uh, been uh, uh, really evaluated more in the past, uh, for instance, uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, but right now, mysticism is not something that is really considered something very important. So in that sense, as a philosopher of the 21st century, yes, I am uh, completely connecting with many knowledges that do not come at all from the Western canon. Uh, and in that sense, uh, uh, India, it is, is a very important uh, place of inspiration. And what I really uh, am inspired about uh, Indian philosophy is that the history of uh, self-inquiry did not end back in the past, but it is something that is reaccessed even right now from many traditions. Uh, think of the yoga tradition, uh, uh, Ramana Maharshi, so many, so many mystics, uh, Sri Aurobindo, so many, so many people are uh, inviting us not to lose sight of this main question, who am I? Because if we lose this question in the details, of course, God is also in the details. Eh? And when I talk about God, I talk about universal cosmic energy. I'm not a creationist. I don't believe in God as separated from anything. I think we're all co-creating this dimension. But when we think about who we are, if we are getting lost in just addressing this specific question, like academia uh, in the Western canon, you just become uh, lost in the details. Then you, you, get, uh, you, you forget who you are. How can you, be, how can you be a great intellectual if you're not asking that question? How can you be a great intellectual only talking about others and you're not talking about yourself without realizing that you are the others and that the others that you are describing 
are describing to your own perspective of them. So in that sense, for me, there is not a good intellectual inquiry without this core existential question of self-knowledge. And of course, that knowledge comes from all traditions, literally all era, literally all areas. But to be honest, what I see right now in the philosophical landscape, this question is still being asked very clearly, very thoroughly from many Eastern traditions, while some Western philosophical tradition has kind of lost sight of this. And there is, this is something that we cannot lose sight of it, not even for one existential second. True, Francesca, that's indeed something to be uh, aware of. That's indeed something to be uh, very meaningfully uh, cognizant about. Uh, thanks a bunch for your insightful answer. Uh, the next question is, uh, is, is slightly, you know, uh, maybe discomforting. Uh, the way, you know, it came to me was also very uh, profoundly disconcerting concerning for me, at least. Um, it, it's something that you espouse your position as a philosophical post-human based on the understanding that human enhancement discourses, if properly handled, would equip and align the post-human on the trajectory of infinite progress, where natural laws and intelligent AI design would complement each other and maybe lead to teleological narratives of progress. Uh, are you uh, optimistic in this regard, or do you think that uh, this would be an exclusionary process where the principles of, you know, Darwin's survival of the fittest or Mbembe's necropolitics would screen out the, uh, let's call them the non-posthuman sentient beings? So uh, how would you, uh, you know, react to that? Thank you so much for your question. I would say that all of this is going to be happening and on some level is already happening. Think, for instance, right now, the way technology is used. You can use technology to uh, enhance your uh, enlightening uh, ways of understanding uh, existence and existing. You can find uh, on YouTube uh, great talks by great minds. Uh, you can also use uh, technology like drones to kill others. You can use face recognition to uh, tag your image on Facebook in order for other people to uh, maybe come today and join our discussion. Or you can uh, use uh, face recognition to uh, discriminate uh, uh, Muslim people in some areas of China, as it has been done. So what I'm saying here is that it is not so much uh, the possibilities that we are unfolding through uh, technological developments. By the way, I'm not a big fan of the notion of progress because progress itself comes with a background. It doesn't have to be that way. So you're right, progress that doesn't have to come with a specific background, but in the history of the Western canon, it has been placed in the history of the Enlightenment. And I'm not talking about Buddhist or, Hindus or Hindu Enlightenment. I'm talking about European Enlightenment in which the notion of progress was based in the linear notion of history in which uh, progress would bring better outcomes of lives. Now, if you look at the time when this notion was conceived, uh, we are going to have a problem because uh, uh, progress was really meant for a few humans living at the time. Uh, think of the Industrial Revolution. Think of late 18, early 19th century. Think of the living condition of workers in factories, which is still the living condition of many workers in factories, maybe nowadays not so much based in India, but based in England, but based in many other uh, countries. Um, so what I'm saying here is that we are constantly changing. We are constantly evolving. And also when I use uh, the notion of evolution, I'm not use uh, a notion of uh, social Darwinism. So evolution also is not going to the better outcome of us. It's simply changing. And in this, uh, it is Darwinian and also post-Darwinian. Eh? Darwin was talking about evolution as a bush uh, in which uh, there is not a linearity of something that is better than others. But also, you know, thinking of uh, the image of the bush 
through uh, through someone like Deleuze, it become a little. There is still some type of linearity. Uh, I like more the idea of the rhizome, in which you know that there right. is constant some form of regeneration. And if you think about it, even species that got extinct nowadays through genetic engineering, they could be on some level brought back to life. So an end is really not an end on some level. Now going back to your question, um, yes, the opportunities that these technologies like, for instance, biogenetic engineering, uh, like uh, mind uploading, are bringing, are real. They are not science fiction. When we are talking about genetic engineering, it's been done on non-humans for more than 20 years. Uh, it's been done on plants for centuries on some level. And it has been done on humans already for some years. Officially, we have the first news of uh, human humans uh, designer babies 2017, probably before that, just they didn't make to the news because uh, there are strict guidelines about it. So first step in this discussion is to realize that it's no longer a question, should we do it or not? It is already happening. It is already happening for non-humans and it's also already happening on humans. The question is, what do we want out of it? Because, for instance, I was teaching this class uh, on posthumanism, and one of the topics that we address is uh, genetic engineering. And my take is never, oh, we should do it or not. It's more like we are in this together as a species. How should we deal with this technology that it's happening? Because, again, it's not science fiction. It's no longer a, a question of let's just stop with this research, let's close all the labs that are doing this and focus on something else. It's happening, it's already happening. So. How can we, first of all, we need to know about this uh, without fear or without excitement, with uh, no attachment, seeing what is really happening. Now that we see what is really happening, what we want out of it. And it's interesting because in the past, you know, people were talking about, you know, living forever or um, being able to have multiple bodies. And many of my students, interesting enough, were not interested in that because they were saying, well, you know, life is already comes with a lot of challenges. Having a long life means more challenges. And now if people start to access those kind of technologies, it means that we also have to access it because they will have uh, opportunities that we will not have if we don't have access to those kind of technology. So it almost would also become like a social uh, imperative. Maybe I don't want to do it, but because other people are doing it and they are giving an ontological uh, starting point to my to their children that I'm not giving to mine, then I also have to do it because I want to help my children to at least start from the same privileges. Of course, we are talking about who, who, would have, who would have access to this technology to begin with. But after COVID-19 hit, you know, and pandemic, it was very interesting to see a shift in the discussion. And now students, I was teaching this class uh, at the beginning, for instance, of uh, 2020, and some of my students were based in Wuhan. China, and they didn't have the chance to be physically in New York because of the uh, of the travel bans. And their questions about the whole discussion on human on, on enhancement was very deep, were very different. Their questions were no longer about can we live forever, but were can we, for instance, redesign the human not to be susceptible to specific viruses? Their questions were very practical. And all of a sudden, after the the epidemic in one became a pandemic everyone was interested in this in this discussion to the point that some of the vaccines that we are now we now have have de developed to crispr technologies that were uh, you know some just some years ago thought as some you know science fiction possibilities so we need to be eradicated in our reality not to be lost there but to be able to have wings to be really seeing possible uh, possibilities so the question is no longer should we do this, is uh, this is unfolding, it is happening. So let's not just be terrified about it or just over excited about it so that in either in both cases you're not going to really see the picture, but let's try to stop, breathe, see the picture and see what we want out of this. Where, where are our intentions with these kind of technologies? So the path of uh, human enhancement on some level started with the humans, being humans and evolving, adapting to 
the environment and having the environment adapted to, to humans and then Anthropocene nowadays, uh, we define humans as a geological force. So it is uh, a path that can bring to all these possible scenarios. That's why our intentions, not only as individuals, but as societies, not only as society, but as a species is fundamental. In fact, we are starting to, uh, on some level, uh, redesign the human genome that we want it or not. Some humans has already, have already been uh, designed. Think, for instance, of the case of uh, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, children. In 2017, there were these two sisters. Uh, uh, the name were uh, Lala and, and Lula and Na Nana and something else. You can look into, into that online. But this is just one example. There are many more of these examples. But what I'm trying, the point that I'm trying to make here is that it, it's called the, sorry, the Nana controversy. Uh, 2017, look at it, a Chinese uh, doctor who uh, did some uh, real genetic editing on human uh, embryos. But uh, apart from that specific case, once we are working with human embryos, we are accessing the human genome. The human genome is not separated by genders or by nations or by societies or by classes. It is one big pole. So we need to think about these as a species. This is of extreme importance and is also a discussion that can become very heated. So this is not a reason to start to hate others or oh, those Indians that are doing it or Americans that are doing it or Chinese that are not doing it or whatever. It is not about to blame others, but to understand the type of technology that we have and that this technology is something that is on some level unifying us because it is affecting the human genome that doesn't see borders. Because, for instance, Lana, uh, Nana controversy, when Nana becomes uh, a, an older woman or a woman, if she wants to procreate, she might go to another nation, fall in love with some uh, Indian person. And now, uh, all of a sudden, you have her genome mixing with, uh, with uh, all uh, and more of the layers of biology that we can think of. So it's no longer just, oh, let's, you know, like blame those uh, whatever nations that are doing or not doing it is to be aware of what's happening and to think about it thoroughly with all the possibility that can bring. For instance, if we have the chance maybe not to be prone to skin cancer anymore, should we do it or not? You know, of course, the answer is not, uh, you know, like biological engineering. Maybe we should be more aware of our ecological habits. But these are questions that we need to be really serious about. You know, for instance, uh, the vaccine. Uh, it is important to understand that it's going to affect our DNA on some level. Uh, so, it, these are real questions, but we need to be eradicated in our uh, reality to be able to see and to be able to be giving real answers, not just answer based on fear or not just answer based on some tech utopian writing come from 200 years ago. It is to be aware of our species right now. True, Francesca. The blame gaming won't help anyone. It's, it's the wakefulness once again. Uh, I certainly second your observation. Um, coming to the next question, which I consider is a very, very important question. Uh, you are empathetic to the idea of a coterminous uh, coexistence of a human come technological come green biological continuum, if I might say. So uh, how do you think this affects the issue of speciesism? Uh, of uh, animal ethics, of post-colonial animality and zoontologies. Uh, your take on that, Francesca. It's such an important question. So uh, when I started to be interested in the question of the post-human, the reason was very simple, and it connects to many discussions that we had, had before today. It's uh, related to the question of self-knowledge. So when, I, uh, when we all start to ask who we are, and this is start very early in our life, and between age three and eight, uh, we start to add layers by, by being uh, experiencing existence. So one of the layers that eventually come is, uh, what, does it mean, what does it mean to be human? So when I start to ask, uh, uh, what is the posthuman? Of course, the question that is at the core of the posthuman inquiry is what does it mean to be human in the 21st century? 
That's why I think that the posthuman uh, philosophy is really the, the philosophy of our time. And when I say posthuman philosophy, I really include all the different uh, nuances that come out there, that some of them are really in contrast with each other. Right? But all of that is a wave of reflection that is happening. Now, my answer, and I'm not saying it is the finite answer or anything like that, but my answer, when I was able to step back and look at myself as a human living, one of many possible humans, but as a human living in the 21st century, my answer was that being human in the 21st century meant being aware of many other layers that really co-constitute the human. Now, I'm going to focus specifically on two of them, being aware of the fact that these are not just the, lay, the, the layers of understanding that we need, but are very focal uh, points in our uh, understanding of existence in this specific special temporal time that we are in. So I started to uh, see uh, defining the human in uh, conjunction, but ontological conjunction, uh, to ecology and technology without a hierarchy. So it's not that ecology or humanity or technology come first, they are in this merging of co-creation. So for instance, if you think about technology, the same device, the same computer, the same laptop that I am using right now, at one point was natural resources that were harvested in different parts of planet Earth, brought together, and eventually is going to go back to Earth, unfortunately at the moment, with really a, a mindless way of recycling. Uh, most laptops are just uh, places without uh, any type of uh, recycling in landfills, at least in the US. Uh, and that's really something that needs to be changed right now. And uh, UC Parica, the Anthropocene, showed this very, very clearly. Now, when we think of these three layers in conjunction, we, of course, we are seeing the human also as what has been defined historically as non human. In fact, when we look at us in the big picture, we share our DNA with, uh, with every uh, biological beings, even with fruit and vegetables, and of course with non-human animals. For instance, chimpanzee, 95% of our DNA is shared with them. So when we look really without uh, uh, social narratives that are teaching us that we are the best ones, that are teaching us that we were creating in an image of a specific God that somehow is anthropocentric, when God supposedly should not really be any centrism because God, in all tradition, is in, it's everything. So how can God be anthropocentric? Doesn't make any sense to me, at least. But there are some traditions that have been teaching the human in anthropocentric way. Why? I think because uh, some specific religious narratives come to teach humans at a, a specific historical time. So for instance, maybe when the Bible was uh, revealing, the human were still maybe, you know, animals that can be eaten by other animals. Human can, were still uh, being uh, at uh, many dangers of dying uh, for many different reasons. And so seeing the human as important was important. But nowadays, the number one reason of extinction is our own actions. Number one reason of extinction is our own mindless action, like for instance, atomic bomb, uh, ecological devastation, all of these, still going with anthropocentric, theological, or existential, or a scientific narrative is suicidal. In fact, and this is like cross-crossing fields. This is not just some uh, anthropocentric reading of uh, the Bible or of uh, uh, the Gita or whatever, is also, uh, you know, in science. Many documentaries that we can watch uh, about the human describe the human as the most evolved species. We need to stop that kind of narratives because they are really not beneficial in any way. They are constructing a veil of ignorance in, in front of our own eyes as individuals, but of course at this level as society that is creating our own path towards the abysm of neglection. Uh, now, every species eventually is going to extinct. If we extinct ourselves because of our own ignorance, 
in Indian terms, it would be karma, action and reaction with no judgment. So I'm not saying that this is good or bad. In that sense, I'm not a, uh, a human or is not any human. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, anti-human. I'm not saying that humans are so bad they should, go, should get extinct, like some people are saying. I'm saying that if we keep going with these uh, uh, suicidal uh, ways of existence, in which what was the dreams of the past, of, for instance, having access to food 24-7. If I think of my grandmother, she had a very tough life. She, uh, she was uh, coming from a peasant's uh, family, and uh, you know, she recalls uh, one year in which her father, a strong patriarchal man, was crying on the ground because a, a big storm had destroyed all the crop of the year, and they had, would have really worried about what they were going to be eating that year. Now, for her, Having access to a supermarket in her, in her older age was a dream come true. It is no longer for me because I'm used to it. So now my dream is seeing humans getting aware of our ecological uh, unfolding. We need to put a full stop right now to ecological devastation because it's suicidal. The reason why we have so many cancers on humans is ecological devastation. And I bring often this example of me, and I am in my 40s, but when I was a child in Italy, uh, someone having, having a cancer, it was a drama. People crying, desperation. Now, people tell you they have a cancer, you ask what kind of cancer? Because people, everyone has, has some type of cancer. Because of pollution, because of devastation of the ecological habitat. Now, we are not just inhabiting the earth. We are not just living on the earth. We are the earth. It would be as some uh, macro, microbiome in our guts saying, oh, I am living in Francesca guts so I can destroy everyone else, every other organ around the guts. Guess what? Eventually, those microbiome would die because Francesca is an organism that is co-creating, co-existing, mm -hmm. and is the health come from in, uh, ancient English meaning for whole. And this Ayurveda is very good on this. Uh, seeing the, the human is all this layer, when you read trying to be healthy, it's not just what you eat, it's not just what you drink, it's not just how you move your body, it's all these layers. The human is a microcosm and is a macrocosm. The micro and the macro are seen as, as interconnected in all mystic visions. And as we said, mystics do see uh, very clearly into the DNA of existence. So going back to our point, um, it is extremely important to be aware of who we are. And being aware of who we are means being aware that we are our planet. We are not just living here. We are our planet. And we are going to be other planets. Human migrating to Mars are going to become Mars. And they are not going to look like we look anymore. With centuries, millennia of evolution, they are going to look very different. In that sense, they're going to be on some level post-humanities that are not human anymore, but genetically related to the human. So one more time, uh, being human in the 21st century can no longer be an anthropocentric, uh, anthropocentric uh, visions in, the, uh, in our consciousness. Those perspectives are outdated. They may have been useful at one point. I think of my mother, think, okay, we can humans, we can do it. Or, or think, you know, like you know, in the Bible time, when maybe, you know, they needed to, uh, to have some type of dignity, to know that, you know, if maybe some uh, uh, disease would kill you so young, you, stu you still were important, you still were created in the image of God. But we don't need those anymore because we know that we are, uh, uh, that we are on some level divine. We know that we are important. Uh, we know that we have an affect, an effect on all other beings, all other species. So we need to now see the real rationality of who we are in relation to all other animals. Uh, on many different levels, even to the legal uh, uh, level. And in that sense, uh, it is very interesting, the whole discussion on non-human personhood. Also in India, for instance, dolphins uh, got recognized as non-human persons in, in law some years ago. So this is not just uh, some uh, you know, theoretical approaches that are out there in the noosphere or in the ivory tower. These have to have an impact on everyday existence, including our laws including the way we perceive ourselves and including the way we write science, including the way we uh, are addressing 
the past, the present and the future. Absolutely, Francesca. Yes, indeed, uh, this sense of interconnectedness uh, is, is absolutely vital in our times. Um, a question that I can't uh, really, uh, you know, bypass, uh, because when we talk about, you know, uh, our, you know, interspecies uh, dependency, uh, we must also talk about the uh, issue of identity as, you know, we a combined species having several intraspecies, uh, you know, issues as well. So my next question would be uh, related to the gender angle. Uh, do you endorse philosophical posthumanism as a praxis? Uh, I, I think you have partially answered this question, but we would want to know a little bit more uh, your take on this. That do you consider or do you endorse a philosophical posthumanism as a praxis that champions a feminist LGBTQIAP uh, non or anti patriarchal or alternate policies of situating the self? Uh, your take on that, Francesca. Thank you so much for this question. Um, I think that whatever comes in our life uh, can be a, a great uh, a teacher. And the pandemic, uh, with all its challenges, has been a great teacher to me. I was pushed to the existential core of myself uh, because of the pandemic. I, was, uh, I needed to ask, uh, what am I doing with my life? What am I doing with my job? What am I doing with my writing? Is posthumanism? something that is really helping us na navigating such a delicate time for instance uh, you know a pandemic that doesn't happen often usually i mean probably with the anthropocene is going to happen more often but you know until recently there were waves of pandemics that, yes of course they are cyclical they keep coming back but it is kind of uh, a specific experience to live through a pandemic in which human consciousness is inundated with with, with fear and pain and death and, um, and grieving. So it is, uh, on some level, a, a very challenging time, but also a unique opportunity to really, uh, really perceive the finitude of existence while still being alive. Because we are in all of this together, although we're all different, we can perceive the grieving and the, the depth of, uh, of the experience of dying as, a, as, a, as humans, it's all over, it's in the news, it's, it's in our consciousness of going outside and having to wear something because you may get a disease and you may be fine, but you may be not. And the people around you who may got a disease and may be fine or maybe not, and all the numbers and, and, and the images. Um, now, all of these push me to really ask myself, what am I doing? Which is a question that I always ask myself in any case. But of course, the question became also about posthumanism. And I had to ask myself, are we just losing ourselves in terminology? Are we just writing because it's our job? Are we just uh, creating a new language that is going to create a new layer, layer of chaos in the uh, Tower of, Bab of Babel? So I looked deeply into myself and I found some relief uh, in seeing that posthumanism was not just that, was a way of existing. Because if it was just that, I would have been, uh, it, it would have been enough for me. And I must say that I, because of COVID uh, and the pandemic, I, I, I become much more, uh, much less uh, patient with some type of writing. Uh, when I now read the, even posthumanist accounts that are just too technical and too terminological, and to focus on small details without accessing the big question, I'm asking myself, are we damaging human consciousness or are we helping anyone with this? So I'm writing now my second book, which is all about posthuman praxis. And it's almost kind of going to the opposite. It's almost like going to almost be, being able to talk to everyone with a very refined language. I feel at least in this moment of my life, it may change again. But I feel at the moment to use very few references, but more examples and a, a, a evocative terms that can really get people understanding that this is not just something we're studying. Because if it were just something we're studying, we don't need it. 
We don't need to study anymore. We may die tomorrow. Sorry to say that, but it is true. It is real. If I die tomorrow, to know more isms would not help me in any way. But to be able to really see deeper in what it's happening, not only in the species and in the pandemic, but inside of me because of the pandemic, that is always going to be with me, no matter what is going to happen with myself. And when I think of death, I think of transformation. Nothing dies in chemistry. I'm not talking about you know, afterlife. I'm not talking about rebirth. I'm not talking about reincarnation. I'm not talking about heaven or hell or anything like that. I'm talking about pure chemistry. In chemistry, nothing is born and nothing dies. There is always constant transformation. And so are we. We are energies. We are transforming constantly right now. My body is, is shifting right now. Some cells that were on my body are dying and, more, and others are generating. And so when we die, it is going to be transformation as well. So in that sense, those kind of approaches of posthumanism as a way of existing, to me, at the moment, maybe because pan the pandemic had a huge impact on my consciousness, I took it very seriously because I had to think about it very seriously. And uh, it really shifted. And to me, posthumans can only be a praxis. If it is just a theory, I think, forget about it. Don't even bother. Do something else. Take a walk. Uh, you know, breathe. Do anything else. But it, if it is, if, if it's becoming a way for you to see deeper layer inside of you and of you as reverberating as the whole, as, as humanity, as the planet, as the cosmos, then yes. Use it, be that, bring your visions, help us understanding through your eyes, be part of the conversation, partake in the, in the quest, because this is what I'm seeing, but other people are going to see different things, and I want to hear from them, because their vision, although connecting to mine, is going to be unique, and it's going to be an archetype, and I want to know what kind of archetypes others are unfolding right now in this dimension that we are together. So, of course, all the you know, layers of understanding that you talk about, feminism, post-colonialism, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, anti-black movement, all of that, of course, has to be part of who we are. Because if we keep going on with social illusion of mastery, now I am better because I am a woman or a man. I am better because I am... Um, Brahmin or Dalit. I am better because I am Western or Eastern. I'm that can be a social game that we may want or may not want to play. I don't want to play that, but you know, some people may be interested in playing that. But there's going to be creating veil of ignorance because they are going to create an illusion of masteries that we do not have. The only mastery that we have access to is inside of us. But of course, the inside is the outside. We are the reflection. We are the ocean. We are the unfolding. So the only access that we have to existence is the inside as the outside. If we learn who we are, are from these social categories that we learn pretty late in life because we start to really mastering those social categories in our teenage, as teenagers. Children are not even really so keen on saying, I am uh, female, I am man, I am uh, white. And, like, they learn that through socialization, through social constructions. Now, we don't need those social categories because it's a game that is, has been played for many centuries and millennia. If you look at the big picture and a, a big clock of time for not very long, but still long enough, it's a game that brings a lot of pain. Now, if you want to play the pain game, just you can play the game. I'm not too interested in that game because pain comes anyway. So pain, we're going to experience pain anyway in our existence. You know, people that we love are going to die. That's going to bring pain and so on. So I think that, you know, we can play different games instead of playing more games that bring more pain and terror and violence and, and, and brutality. So in that sense, let's create our own game, our own cosmic game, our leader right now. And in that sense, Posthumanism can be of help. Absolutely, Francesca. Uh, our temporal urgencies do coax us to, you know, transcend all kinds of labels. Uh, so very rightly worded. All your, uh, you know, observations are so vital for us. Uh, we are, uh, you know, moving ahead with time. I don't have many, uh, you know, 
uh, questions uh, to ask, but I have a couple of, you know, some very important questions that have been thrown to me. Uh, the next question that I would uh, like to ask you is uh, related to, you know, of course, uh, the mentions that you've just made uh, in, in, in some of your past observations. The era of the high Anthropocene is critically uh, provocative of an avaricious consumerist sensibility that the environmental historian and socialist Jason Moore uh, describes as the capital scene. Again, the Finnish new media theorist Jussi Parikka in the Anthropocene has critiqued contemporary digital lives as ubiquitous, not conducive to ecological health, but instead proleptic of an environmental wasteland. Now, my question is, will post-human idealism be capable of finding uh, remedies uh, to such malaises? Francesca. Thank you so much for your question. I would like to um, start from a realization that although we, ha we are who we are, and this is also said in the Bible, Exodus, eh? God, when asked who is God, say, I am who I am. So we all are who we are. But we are also dreaming, we're also living in the dreams of others. Let me explain this. Uh, the building in which I am right now has been built many uh, years before I was born. The cities uh, that have been moving around in my life has been around for many centuries before I was born. The type of life that I am having is a dream come true for, for instance, the generation of my grandmother. Uh, she had a very uh, intense uh, uh, life. She lived through two world wars. Uh, her son died when he was 16 because of poor living condition. Uh, she was, her mother died when she was six because of a fever that today would be, you know, you take some penicillin and you would not die. Her father died of also another disease that you would not die of today because it's a very simple one to be killed. Um, she, the idea of uh, being in our society for her was a relief. Uh, she uh, could really not uh, uh, stop uh, uh, counting the blessings that we as a generation have that we are not even aware of. Now, acknowledging this, acknowledging that uh, that's where we come from, of course, now we are on the opposite. Many societies, of course, there is still a lot of people that are still living the type of life that my mother, uh, grandmother had. Uh, some many, many people on life Earth, on, uh, on Earth right now, are, are, are dying of malnutrition, are dying of diseases that can, could be very easily uh, healed of. Think of malaria, think of uh, many others. So this condition is still going on. But other people, including myself, are living in a society that is capitalistic. That is, uh, uh, that is uh, uh, consumeristic. Now, I don't want to necessarily just blame society. I want to say that this is also the result of not having. Eh? So coming from millennia in which uh, surviving was the most amazing thing we could do, uh, the idea, think for someone, you know, dying of hunger, even nowadays, having access to anything that we want, almost anything that we want, even online. I don't even need to go shopping right now. I am privileged enough that I can, you know, order almost anything I want online, which may be delivered by Amazon in two, one day, or even sometimes in the same hour. Now, this is a real dream come true for people who came before us. Now, we don't need to acknowledge their experience to understand why we find ourselves right now here. But now we also need to acknowledge where this dream, dream is becoming a nightmare. Now, is it becoming a nightmare because it's creating a nightmarish situation all around us? If we look at the images of, for instance, the Amazon forest burning, it looks mm. like uh, uh, the, the picture of uh, a cancer, of a body died of cancer. Uh, the, the, the burning of the Amazon forest is uh, we are killing our lungs. The Amazon forest is one of the lungs of planet Earth. We are killing that. We are literally, in that sense, like a cancer without wanting to judge the human in general because we are many and there are many levels of consciousness. And of course, the people burning the Amazon, they are doing it because they need some type of money to survive and by burning the land, they can rent it to uh, or sell it to McDonald's to have their cows 
been there to be killed for your human consumption of meat that is unhealthy and is not good for us anyway as a species with the kind of uh, type of diet. Now, there are all these layers. Now, I would like to be able to try to access the high Anthropocene without anger, if it's possible. I know that uh, uh, we come from a triumphalist view of anthropocentrism, in which too many people are still uh, are still in in anthropocentrism as the opium of our society. And Marx talks about religion as the opium of people. I talk of, as anthropocentrism as the opium of our uh, scientists and uh, technologists who love to say how great we are, blah, 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 blah. We are not. We are just one of many. And we are fine. We are not horrible either. That's why I say I'm not an anti-human either. But we need to be aware. So if I have a cancer in my body and I act, nothing is happening. I'm saying, you know, I'm perfectly fine. Uh, I do nothing. I just keep home with my habits. I, I smoke all day long. I eat very badly. I say nothing is happening. That's not helping. Of course, could help saying, uh, you know, I'm, I'm well I'm, by changing my habits. I cannot just uh, keep repeating I'm well if I'm keeping doing all the other things that are killing me because my body is not stupid. My body is intelligent. So my mind might say I am uh, well. My body says I'm not well. And if your mind don't stop telling yourself you're well, uh, I'm going to be dying because you keep smoking and you keep eating bad food and you keep doing all these bad things for you. The same as a species. We may say we are great, but if we are keep doing the same habits, we are killing ourselves. Now, I'm not saying that that's bad or, or good. Maybe by having the human extinct, like some anti-human say, other species may do better than us. I, I don't think so. I think that it's always a matter of uh, awareness. I think that AI also might do really bad uh, or really well. I mean, this is a matter of realizing that there are so many layers and the human is not one, but many. And there are enlightened human right now. And there are also humans that are not. Uh, and are still dealing with ignorance and are still feeding themselves with ignorance and with lies and with social lies and political lies and all these other lies. Now, of course, it is a matter of agency. And of course, it's a matter of stopping and saying, I'm not blaming the government. I'm not blaming the other humans. I'm not blaming anyone. I am not blaming myself, but I stop and I realize who I want to be. Do I want to know who I am? Do I want to know who we are as a species? Do I want to know where are we going as a society? If the answer is yes, we need to address all of this in conjunction, not from a place of fear or anger. And in this sense, I would like maybe disconnect a little bit from the anger that comes with a lot of uh, maybe, uh, you know, engaged posthumanists who, you know, are really vocal also in anger about, you know, like... Uh, the Anthropocene. I think we need to be aware of that, but anger is not going to help because anger is going to close many doors of people who may have been open to listen to us. So when we are angry, no one wants to listen to us because the, the message is not the message we want to vocalize, is anger. So even if someone loves you, say, I love you. It's like, oh, you know what? Come back later on and tell me that you love me in a loving way. So if we really love our planet, if we really love our species, if we really want to be uh, um, if we really want to be empathetic and if you really want to bring the change that we are talking about, that cannot come with anger. I understand that there is a lot of uh, urgency in this. So urgency, it, it should be clear. Yes, we should change our laws right now. I'm actually proposing that no areas where there are uh, abandoned houses or abandoned buildings could uh, allow for cons new constructions. We cannot Learn. We cannot re uh, cut one more tree on planet Earth. They not, are not only they don't only have uh, the right to exist, but they are giving us oxygen for us to be healthy. Uh, so they are such important maps of human health. Not even talking about biosphere. So in that sense, uh, uh, of course, uh, it is very urgent. Not just urgent, extremely urgent to be addressed right now. But the way to do it, to me, it is also very important to try to uh, do it with, uh, uh, with uh, kind urgency and, uh, and, and, and complete clarity. And when we, have, we are angry, angry doesn't allow us for clarity. It creates this uh, hot environment in our mind that distorts a little bit the vision. So even if the vision is uh, almost accurate, cannot be fully accurate 
if it is spoken with words of anger. So very important to talk about the high Anthropocene, uh, but I would uh, recommend to try to do it with uh, uh, real uh, clarity, uh, real routine of us as part of the species, not us as the saviors. There are no saviors here. We're all part of this, and we are all changing it if we want. True, true, true. Yes, uh, Francesca, indeed. Uh, you know, along with this uh, sense of inclusivity, we must also uh, keep in mind the fact that agency, the fact of the agency is the ultimate deciding factor and agency must begin with the self, um, so to begin with. Um, I, I think you have already asked my uh, next question. You, you have already answered my next question, which uh, kind of, you know, focused on uh, planetary futures. And uh, indeed, it's true that we can't, uh, you know, leave everything or we can't abandon a sense of future to a demoniacal cosmology. Uh, of course, there is scope uh, to, uh, you know, re-introspect ourselves and the choices that we are making uh, almost on a daily basis. Um, my final question to you, uh, and I think we are sticking to time. Um, and, and this question is, is very important, Francesca, because uh, as you know, Calcutta Comparatists 1919, they have uh, given me this honor to conduct this uh, interface with you. Uh, it, it does consist of a, a bunch of very talented, uh, sincere, and uh, very dedicated researchers uh, and, and young people. Uh, so the question would automatically be focused on them, not only to them alone, but also to all the young researchers all over the world uh, who are listening to you right now or would be listening to you uh, shortly. What specific areas of critical inquiry would you prescribe for young enthusiasts and researchers of post-humanist studies today? Francesca. Thank you so much. I always say my students, I always tell my students that in order to be uh, bringing something unique to the table, you, you need to be studying and writing and researching about something that is very, very important to you. Not something that your professor think is important, not something that your parents think that is important, not something that even your society think that is important. Something that is extremely important to you. Because if you write, if you research, if you work on something that it is really important to you, you're going to be passionate about it. Passion in a good way, not passion that doesn't allow you to think things. Passion that gives you the energy and the strength to go on in your path of research, which is not an easy one. There are many distractions in life. There are many commitments in life that can take away from our time sp spent in research. Although everything at the end of the day can become part of our existential inquiry, which is going to inform our academic research. Now, my first advice is make sure to focus on something that you care about and be clear about why that is important. So if you want to really work on something that no one else is working on and your professors or your friends say, why are you focusing on that? Who cares about it? Have the, think about it before proposing that to them. Uh, take some days, months, even years before you have a very clear vision of what really, really touches your, 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 the strings of your existential being. Eh? Of course, it might not take years, especially if you're an academic, you've already been trained to really research. So you know how to do it. But don't research on something just because it's fashionable. Don't research on something just because other people tell, they tell you that you should do that. Don't research on something just because uh, uh, it's something that sounds good. Look into that. Find an area that brings meaning to your own life. By writing this for others, write this for you to begin with. If you are getting bored with your own writing, everyone else is going to be, be bored with your own writing. No one else is going to learn anything from you. If you are excited about what you write about, which means you're honest and you're looking at all the different school of thoughts that have been addressing that, but you bring your own unique voices and perspective. That is something I want to hear about because I will never be you. We will always be in this together, but I will, will never be able to access your perspective unless you are so generous 
is to share that with me. So by looking deeper into yourself, trying to find you really what matters to you, researching about that, writing about that, you are going to bring the most precious gift you can ever give to humanity, to yourself, to your family, to your species, to all the people who came before you, to all the people who are here right now, and to all the people who came after you. Think, for instance, of many, many people we could mention. One that comes to my mind is Nietzsche. Nietzsche was writing about things that he knew the people in his era could not understand. He self-published himself. No one wanted to publish him. He lost his job at university. He knew that he was writing for the future. He wrote for the, for the generation to come, to come because he knew that they were the ones who could understand him. He was absolutely right. He's one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century. But he was not given any credit when he was alive until he was actually not uh, there with his mind anymore. And unfortunately, his sister made him a hero of the Nazis and that's a whole different story. He was not in any way, any way a Nazi, nor a nationalist at all. He was one of the first European minds we can think of. But what I'm trying to tell you is really write about something that is important to you. Bring your own experience to the conversation because that's unique. Your uh, perspectives, your background, your experiences, of course, are informed and connected to everyone else because as humans, we share a lot of our collective consciousness. But your own unfolding, your own specificity, specificities are unique to you like flowers. There are many daisies. There are many roses. They're all beautiful, but each of them is, is unique. And maybe in the same plant, one flower has a slightly different taste than the other one. That's what, that what we are interested in, in your own unique flavor that is helping us all understand who we are as the beautiful plant of roses that we are. If you're just repeating the smell of another rose by putting some perfume on, I know that smell. I don't need to read you. I can read the Rida or uh, Shubadip or, uh, or Deleuze or uh, uh, Gayatri Spivak or anyone else. But what is your voice? Don't think that you need to come with a, you know, like a big uh, explosion of intellectual uh, uh, explanations. No one requires you to do that because that is happening every second in human consciousness. But as an academic, the best gift you can give is bringing your unique perspective, which sometimes is a tiny little fragment of, of understanding that is not there yet, to the conversation. Bring your experience. Bring your vision. Look inside of you to inform the outside. Look outside to inform the inside and deeply know that the microcosm is the macrocosm and the macrocosm is the microcosm. Well, uh, so that sums it up. Um, I, I think uh, your, your final observation, the very final line, uh, would uh, kind of, you know, remain soaked in our minds for a long time, Francesca. Yes, it is this deep sense of interconnect that uh, I think we have been able to achieve over the last one and a half hours uh, that would remain very vital uh, for us in times to come. Our sincerest gratitude to you for reaching out to us with the profundity of your uh, philosophical wisdom, your post-humanist insight. I'm sure we will be picking up cues uh, from this for further investigative sojourns in the post-humanities. Love and regards, dearest Francesca. Stay safe, stay blessed. And uh, this also goes out to all you wonderful post-humans out there. With that, I hand over uh, the forum to um, Jemima. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ferrando and Dr. Paul, for this wonderful, mesmerizing, and energetic session. Uh, now, I would request Shuparna to deliver the uh, vote of thanks. Shuparna, over to you. Thank you, Jemima Di. On the behalf of Calcutta Comparatists 1919 and its members, I would like to convey our hearty thanks to Dr. Francesca Ferrando and Dr. Shubhadi Paul for their excellent discussion on Dr. Ferrando's book. A big thank you to you both for sharing your ideas and views on this book. I would like to express our gratitude 
to you for responding to us and coming to our forum. We are really inspired by your great words. Thank you to all of our audience on YouTube for being with us today. Here we officially conclude this session now. Stay tuned for our upcoming events on this channel. Thank you. Good night and good day to Dr. Ferrando. I would like to thank you so much, Shubadeep, Jemima, Shupana, for this wonderful session, for the beautiful work that you're doing. Thank you so much for hosting this conversation. And of course, this is the beginning of many, many, many more projects, visions, and researches. Thank you so much. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.